Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Hey, are you ready to get into the word of the Lord this morning? Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. If you're able to stand, would you join me as we stand and go before the Lord in prayer in honor and reverence? Father God, we come before you today. Lord, we are just so grateful that we have the opportunity to come into the house of the Lord. God, we don't come into this place to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. God, we don't come to church for entertainment. Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. And Lord, it's in the name of Jesus that we ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us to remind us of things, Father, to to comfort and to, to speak into our lives, to open our eyes to see and our ears to hear your word as you would have us to hear it today, Lord, that I pray that it would be a seed planted into good ground in our hearts and in our lives, that we could apply it, that we could water it, and it would grow and flourish and bear much fruit in our lives, God. And we give you the glory and the praise. Lord, the blessings that we ask upon ourselves Lord, we don't ask that just upon ourselves, but Lord, we ask that upon all the churches across the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, at no time do we think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but Lord, we truly are co-laborers in the body of, of Christ, working together to grow and to serve in the kingdom of God, and we glorify you for that. So Father, with that, we ask that you set your hand upon our Catholic brothers and sisters and our Baptist brothers and sisters, our, our Methodist, Lutheran, Episcopalian, and Presbyterian brothers and sisters. Lord, I thank you that you set your hand upon our Seventh-day Adventist, Lord brothers and sisters in our uh, charismatic and our Pentecostal brothers and sisters. Lord, I thank you for the churches all across the Inland Empire. So many, too many to name, but Lord, I thank you for Harvest Christian Fellowship, for the Sandals, for the Grove, for the Way World Outreach Center, for Inland Christian Center, for Ecclesia Christian Center, for Emmanuel Baptist, God, for, for, uh, uh, for Crossroads Christian Center, God, for Abundant Living in Oak Valley, all the churches all across the Inland Empire and around the world. Lord, we thank you that you're, the blessings that we ask upon ourselves, Lord, you would also bestow upon them. We thank you that we are many members of one body, the body of Christ, serving and working together to grow and to build the kingdom of Jesus and the kingdom of God. And we give you the praise, Lord. We give you the honor and give you the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, and we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God as you're being seated. Go ahead and grab your Bibles. You got your Bibles with you today. And go ahead and open them. If your Bible's like my Bible, it it just flaps open to the book of Hebrews as it is. And that's great because that's where we're going. We're going to continue in on our study of Hebrews. If you're just joining us today, what we do here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center is we go line upon line, precept upon precept. What that means is the Bible was written that way. You know, it it wasn't written in chapter, verse, and, and book. It was written as letters and as, as stories. And so we're going through line upon line, precept upon precept. We're going through the Word of God with a fine tooth comb. And we've been studying in the book of Hebrews for, for many a, a month, actually many a year at this point. And we find ourselves here in Hebrews, the fifth chapter. We've been in Hebrews, the fifth chapter, the ninth verse for a few weeks. And now we get to move into the tenth and the eleventh verses. And I'm excited for what God's got in store. The title of this morning's message, if you're taking notes and I want to encourage you, let me say this before we even go any further, I'm going to give you a lot of scripture references. I'm not going to put them all up on the overheads. Normally we put pretty much everything we talk about up on the overheads. And hopefully as this message progresses, you'll see why I'm giving you a lot. And I hope that you'll be inspired. Take notes. Don't just come here to take notes or or don't just come to church to come to church, but listen up, pay attention, and I'll tell you why. And I hope you'll be inspired. I pray that you'll be inspired to, to write these down and to study them during the week because that's what we're talking about today. Today, the title of this morning's message is this. It's called Sharpening Your Hearing. Sharpening your hearing. Now, I'm not talking about sharpening your axe or sharpening your knife. And let me say this to our wonderful deaf community and those who who are wondering, I am not speaking to your ability to hear wavelengths and sound waves and translate them into words. I'm not talking about your physical hearing. What I am talking about is your spiritual hearing. And we want to talk today about sharpening our spiritual ability to hear or to understand, to comprehend the Word of God. So here we find ourselves in Hebrews in the fifth chapter. Hebrews in the fifth chapter. Now I'm going to read verse number nine so we can see a little bit of context of what we're talking about. In Hebrews, the fifth chapter, the ninth verse says this, and having been perfected, he, speaking of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Now you remember the past few weeks we've been talking about the proof of our belief and obedience being that proof. Now we move into verse number 10. Verse number 10 says, called by God, 
Uh, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, before we move any further, we're going to move through verse number 10 and into verse number 11. But I don't want you to think that we're skipping through because we do go line upon line, precept upon precept. But verse number 10 to us, because we have been doing this, is more of a review. If you recall, in the summer of 2012, we talked about Jesus Christ being our great high priest. Uh, Pastor Jim taught a message talking about Jesus Christ being our compassionate high priest. We talked in October, uh, the subject of being called uh, the, the title of the message was God's choice is you and God chose Abraham called Abraham or I'm sorry Aaron to be the high priest God called Jesus to be the high priest God called and chose you and I to be representatives of him so we've talked about Jesus Christ being called we've talked about Jesus Christ being our great high priest the order of Melchizedek if you recall we talked about this a few weeks ago or a few months ago in Hebrews the fifth chapter don't worry if you missed it we have not touched on this subject in depth Really what Pastor Jim has announced is that the, the author of Hebrews really dives into the order of Melchizedek and this, 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 this foreign concept to you and I of Melchizedek in the seventh chapter. So as we get into the seventh chapter, we're really going to hit this subject of Melchizedek with more and greater detail. So I want to tell you to hold on to that because we're, we're not skipping past it, but we're waiting until the author of Hebrews really dives into that. So here we see that Jesus Christ is called as our great high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now in verse number 11, we read this. Verse number 11 of Hebrews, the fifth chapter says, of whom we have much to say. Of whom? Who are we talking about? Well, Jesus Christ. We have a lot to say about Jesus Christ. There's more than we can say about our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that would cover more than just one service. Uh, how about the order of Melchizedek? Melchizedek is a foreign concept or a foreign subject to you and I. And so there's a lot to be said about Melchizedek. Or how about Jesus Christ being our great or our compassionate high priest? We could spend weeks and months talking about Jesus Christ, our high priest. And we'll see some of that further on in the book of Hebrews. So there's a lot that we have to talk about. And here the author of Hebrews is saying there's much to say. But look at what he says. It's hard to explain. Now, I want to encourage you. It's not hard to explain because these subjects are so deep or so above your ability to understand. Oftentimes what we hear or what we say to ourselves or to other people is, you know, the Bible is just so difficult, I don't understand it. And here the author of Hebrews is saying the same thing. These are some subjects that are hard to explain, not because they're so deep that you can't get it, but look what he says. They are hard to explain because you have become dull of hearing. You see, the Bible tells us, the Word of God tells us about the Word of God that is given to us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something. If the Holy Spirit can inspire the Word of God to be written, to be preserved over thousands of years, don't you know that the Holy Spirit can inspire you and I as we read and hear the Word of God to understand and comprehend what it is? So let me encourage you that the Word of God is not above your understanding, but you and I have got to sharpen our hearing so that we are not like the subjects of the of the book of Hebrews here, where he says, you have become dull of hearing. Let me explain the idea or the concept of being dull or hearing. Adult of hearing. You know, I have in my family, my sister's on the front row. Uh, she has a, 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 her oldest son, James, is, is 12, right? I got the age right? Okay. I have a little brother-in-law on my wife's side. He is 12 as well. I have two junior high boys in my family. Now, we're talking about the subject or the concept of being dull of hearing. Now, if you have junior high kids, or hey, hey, if you have teenagers, this subject makes sense to you already. You get it. But my, my nephew and my brother-in-law, I remember my brother-in-law, he's doing right now, he's, he's in algebra. Remember when you had algebra? You, had, I remember, you probably remember asking this question, when am I ever going to use this? When you have algebra, you ask yourself that question, and the answer to that question, let me give it to you right now, is when your kids have algebra. <laughs> and so here my little brother was at our house, and he was, doing, uh, uh, he was doing his homework, and he was doing exponents and square roots, and we were trying to explain his homework, and we're, you know, we're trying to figure out and trying to remember what it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, whatever, uh, about what we were learning in school. And we're, you know, thank, good, thank goodness for calculators and Google. He can't use it, but we can. And so we're trying to explain it to him. And I remember that face, that 12-year-old that boy's face, when you're trying to explain math and exponents and square roots, that, that you parents might know this face, the face is like this. 
How about this? You've seen it. Your teenagers, they wear those headphones in their ears, and you're talking to them, and what are they doing? They're tuning you out and excluding you, and they're listening to what they want to hear. Epitome of dullness of hearing, right? Amen. We love our teenagers. We love the teenagers. We love our youth group and our youth ministry, but praise God, they get through it. Dullness of hearing. And so here the author of Hebrews is saying the same thing. You, uh, and the interesting thing is he says you have become. See, the thought here is, is that at one point they were listening. At one point they were hearing. At one point they were growing. They got the word of God and they were putting it into them. They were getting it into them and they were growing in the things of God. But then something had happened, he says here, and he says, you have become. You have allowed yourself to plateau in your walk with God or in your spiritual understanding. And because you have stopped your growing, you have stopped your hearing or you're listening to the word of God, these subjects, these deeper subjects in the word of God become difficult or hard to explain. So it's a essential for you and I to, to not allow ourselves to become dull of hearing. You know, there are so many things in life that would cause us to be dull of hearing or to become dull of hearing. You know, pride. Oftentimes we think, oh, I'm going to listen to myself or my own opinion versus what that person or what the Bible says because I know more than that person or I'm older or whatever it might be. How about, how about complacency? You know what? I got saved. I got delivered from where I was. I'm happy where I'm at, and I'm glad. You know, I'm, I'm not where I was. I'm happy where I'm at. I don't need to go any further. How about laziness? The Word of God rubs us the wrong way. Don't want to do that. Ah, it's just too much work for me. I'm good where I'm at. Bitterness. Maybe you were believing God for something or you were standing in faith and it didn't pan out the way you were believing or you saw somebody and they were believing and, and, and it just didn't pan out the way. And you say, God, why didn't you have this seed of bitterness or this root of offense in your heart? And you think, well, how can I obey or how can I? And so the seed of bitterness can cause us to become dull of hearing. How about selfishness? I don't want to give up the things that I am or the things that make me or the things that I have in order to, to promote the kingdom of gospel or the, Jesus, or the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so selfishness can cause us to tune out or to lay back on the word of God. There are so many things, and I don't want to focus in on what causes us to become bitter or, or I'm sorry, what causes us to become dull of hearing because there's so many things. But what we can do is look at how to become or how to sharpen, how to, how to increase our hearing ability and our ability to understand and comprehend the Word of God. So today, let's talk about that. You know, Paul, in the book of Galatians, in the third chapter, tells the Galatian church, he says, did you receive the Spirit from works or by hearing faith? And so here he's talking about the subject of hearing. Now, let me talk to you about the subject of hearing. In Romans, the 10th chapter, the 17th verse, tells us that faith comes by what? Hearing. hearing. Faith comes by hearing. And how does hearing come? Hearing by the Word of God. So let's reverse that order and we see that the Word of God is spoken, the Word of God is preached, the Word of God is read or we see it, we get it into us and from the Word of God it builds our faith. Are you with me today? Yeah. Now, Hebrews in the 11th chapter, the 6th verse tells us that without faith it is impossible to please God. So remember, we talked about faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Now remember, we're not talking about physically hearing, but spiritually understanding or spiritually getting into it, spiritually getting the word of God into us. So faith comes by the word of God being preached. We put it in, we apply it. And the Bible tells us that we have got to have faith in order to please God. I don't know about you, but I want to please God. Well, then the Bible goes a little bit further in James, the second chapter, and it tells us, James, the second chapter, tells us that faith without works is what? Dead. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't think God wants us to have dead faith, but rather alive faith, real faith. So you see, you and I have got to hear, we have got to understand, we have got to comprehend the Word of God. That builds our faith, but our faith cannot just stop at our belief system. We have got to act on it, we have got to move on it, we've got to, to use it in our lives, and in doing so, like Hebrews 11 chapter tells us, we will please God. Why? Because we have faith, like James says, not dead faith, but alive faith, because our faith is backed by our works. Are you with me today? So you see, it is essential for us us to sharpen our hearing because faith is how we please God and the way faith comes is by us to sharpen our hearing and to not become dull of hearing. Are you with me today? Are you still there? Okay. So today let's talk about 
Let's talk about sharpening our hearing. Sharpening our hearing. I want to give you some things. Common sense. Very simple principles. We do this all day, every day in the world, outside of the church. But sometimes we don't apply these in our relationships with God. And you would think that these are common sense. But don't you know that common sense is not always so common. So today we're going to look at some things according to the Word of God, some very basic, simple principles about sharpening our hearing. Now listen, I want to encourage you, if you have, it doesn't matter how long you have been saved, it doesn't matter if you got saved last week or 20 or 50 years ago, you can get yourself into the position like the Hebrews of becoming dull of hearing. But the beautiful thing is, is that it's not over for you. You see, you can shake yourself of the stagnancy or the complacency in your life and start to sharpen your hearing. doesn't matter where you are or what walk of life you are in with your walk with God. You can sharpen your hearing. Look at the disciples. The disciples did not spend 20 years in seminary school learning from Jesus. They spent three years of ministry working with and hearing from and, and seeing the example of Jesus Christ. And then Jesus had empowered them after when he ascended to, to heaven. He gave them the authority. And even after... Jesus had empowered them. Don't you know, they made mistakes. Peter was rebuked by Paul by, because he treated the Jews one way and the Gentiles another way. You see, Peter himself, even after he was empowered by God, had become dull of hearing. But because of the rebuke and because of the correction, he fixed the issue in his life and he sharpened his hearing. So it doesn't matter where you are or what, 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 where you are in your walk with life, you can sharpen your hearing and you need to sharpen your hearing. I need to sharpen my hearing. This is for each and every one of us in this room. So I want to encourage you. Don't, don't tune out. Sharpen your hearing today. Listen up. Number one for today, we're talking about sharpening our hearing. Number one is you and I have got to quiet down. Listen. How can we expect to hear anything from God when our life is so busy? You know, I remember we were at Disneyland a couple of weeks ago and our whole family was all together and we were eating dinner and it was right along one of the main routes of Disneyland and at, during dinner, a parade came through and all the noise of the parade and all the commotion of a Disneyland parade. We were talking, but don't you know when that parade came through, our conversation stopped and we started to look at the parade because it was louder. It was overtaking our time together as a family. Now, that's not a bad thing, but the example is, is that oftentimes in our lives, we allow distractions or we allow uh, our time to be spent in so many other ways, forms, or fashions that we don't give time or we don't give God the attention that he needs or he wants and desires in our life so that he can speak into our lives. You see, Jesus taught, taught us in the, when he was giving us the, the example of the prayer that we go into a, the prayer closet or the secret place, the hiding place, the place that's intimate between God and us because we have to close the things around us. You and I have become very well. Uh, have been, we have become experts at things like watching TV on every free waking moment or listening to the radio as the car, as we're driving in the car. If we have so many distractions in our life, how can we expect God to speak to us over all the different things? And you see, so we have got to set a priority. How about this? You have set a priority. You're here today in church. Praise God. You have made a point to come and hear the word of God. But let me ask you this. Are you here to hear or are you here just to be here? You see, you can come to church and be here and not hear. You get what I'm saying? You're like, people are like, people listening on the CD are going to be like, what? Hearing physically or and hearing, you know. Okay, anyways, let's move on. <laughs> you can come to church. Listen, listen, look, 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 all right. Today is a big day for the United States, all right, okay. You can come to church and you could be thinking about who's going to win. You could be thinking about what you're going to eat, where you're going to go, what you're going to do. You could be thinking, listen, you could come to church and sit in church and be thinking about what's going to happen on Monday, what's going to happen during the week. You can come and sit and think about what, what, what's coming up in your life. You can come and sit and think about vacations, think about where you, where you want to be, think about the weather. You can, you can sit, you and I as humans have the ability to sit in a place, to use our eyes and to look and look as though we are paying attention, but in our minds, in our thoughts, we are thinking and we are somewhere else. And if we are allow ourselves to do that, how do we expect God to sow into our lives when we are not listening to the voice of God? Listen, you can come into church 
And you can focus so much on the person that's speaking, whether he's a man or whether he's a woman or she's a woman, whether, whether they're old or whether they're young, whether they're black or whether they're white, you can focus so much on the person delivering that you lose focus of what they're saying and you're listening to them or you're not listening to them because of an offense or something that you don't like about that person and you can tune out what they're saying and miss what God is speaking. So see, you and I have got to make it a point, to make it a priority, to sit down, to perk up, to say, listen, when I come to church, I am not going to allow distractions to take my thoughts or my my ears away from hearing the Word of God. And I'm going to make it a priority to hear the Word of God. Ecclesiastes in the fifth chapter, the first verse says this. We'll just put it up on, on the screens. It says, walk prudently when you go to the house of God and draw near to hear. Draw near to hear. Do not, rather than to give sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they do evil. Don't come to the house of God. Listen, don't come to church because you think you're going to go to heaven because you sit in a green chair and you listen to a guy talk about the word of God for 35 minutes because that's what the sacrifice of fools are. They think they can pay penance. But rather, when you come to church, perk yourself. If you got to slap yourself, then slap yourself and listen to the word of God. You come here to hear, not to sit in a chair. Walk prudently in the house of God and don't do. They think they're doing good by going into the house of God, but they're not doing anything. They're playing games. The interesting thing is, is James in the first chapter, the 19th verse says this. It says, so then my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak. Let me, let me give you an obvious statement, an obvious observation, okay? Can I, can I do that today? Look at this. Interestingly enough, God gave us, you and I, two ears and one mouth. Maybe, may, just maybe, that's a sign that you and I ought to spend more time listening than speaking. You and I have got to make a priority to quiet down, to listen to the word of God. If you don't make it a priority, if you don't stop the distractions, if you don't shake the complacency off of you, you will miss out and become dull of hearing. And you don't want that. You want to be blessed. I want to be blessed. So we've got to make it a priority in our lives. Are you with me this morning? Secondly, we're talking about... We're talking about how to sharpen our hearing. Number two for today, number two for today, you and I have got to practice. 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 Now, a couple of weeks ago, Jesus was talking to Peter. I use this example. And Jesus said to Peter three times. Remember this? And John, uh, as well as Jesus was talking about, uh, uh, talking about the, the, the evidence of those who love him, he said it three times. So I thought when we hear Jesus say something three times, we kind of perk up and listen. So I thought with this point, if I use that word three times, maybe we would kind of perk up a little bit and listen. But you and I have got to practice, to study, to put and to apply the word of God into our lives. You see, this makes sense in everything we do outside of the church. Let's look at sports. Any, any great sports figure, look, Michael Jordan, uh, uh, Steve Young, uh, uh, Mickey Mantle, Wayne Gretzky, uh, some of the great sports figures you probably know, many more than I do. You know, look at the great sports. They never woke up and said, hey, I'm going to be the best at what I do and never do anything about it. But listen, let's not go to sports. How about intellect? Albert Einstein, Leonardo da Vinci. They didn't just wake up one day and just say, wow, I'm really smart. I don't need education. I don't need to study. I don't need to apply what I've learned. They, they, they did something about it. Okay, what about, what about artists? Michelangelo, Vincent van Gogh, uh, uh, Monet, the different artists of their time. They didn't just wake up one day and pick up a paintbrush and say, wow, look at my talent. You want to be a good businessman. You want to be a good parent. You want to be good at what you do. You put time into doing it. Hey, listen, you go play golf on the weekends or you play softball with your team. You play catch. You practice beforehand. You practice what you do. You want to be a good businessman. You read the different business magazines. You see what they're doing over here, what works over here. You listen to leadership things. Why? Because you want to practice so that you get good. Yet, 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 in our Christian walk, in our relationship with God, for some reason, you and I... Some, we get into this place where we think that we can come to church, listen to a dude speak for 35 minutes once a week, once every two weeks, once a month, and think that that one, that 35 minutes a week 
is good enough for us to get it into our system and we expect God to just make this amazing transformation in our hearts. But it's the same anywhere else. If you want to be good at something, if you want to excel at something, you have got to practice in it. And you have got to study in it. So you want to be good in, in the Word of God? You want to hear the Word of God? You want to understand it better? You want, to, you want God to bless you more than you can imagine? You have got to practice it. You've got to study it. You've got to get it into your system. Paul exhorts a, a young pastor by the name of Timothy. And, and 2 Timothy, we'll just go ahead and put it up in the New King James. Paul exhorts Timothy and he says to him, Timothy, be diligent, be diligent. You know what be diligent means? Work hard to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The old King James says, study to show yourself approved. You see, you and I have got to place in our lives a priority to not just take what we hear from here on a Sunday morning or on a Sunday night or on a Wednesday. Don't just, listen, don't just take notes because the person next to you thinks that you're super spiritual when you take notes. We're all guilty of this, all right? Pastor Luke has been guilty of this, but listen, that was last week. Now we're going to start to, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Write it down. Study it during the week, apply it to your life, and see what God does. You know, as a pastor, oftentimes what happens is we get these questions. We get these questions more often than not, and somebody will come to us and say, Pastor, what does the Bible say about fill in the blank? My question or my answer to them is always now with a question because I begin to see a pattern in people. My, my answer to them is this, what have you found? And nine times out of ten, I'll tell you this, they'll say, I haven't found anything or I haven't looked. And what they're doing is they want the answer, but they don't want to do the work to get the answer. And that right there is a recipe for failure because let me tell you something, it's in the work, it's in the study that you form your beliefs, that you build the internal system. Let me tell you something about the Word of God. It's not like grueling yard work, like digging a hole. When I say put in the work to God, put in the work to study the God, it's not like I'm telling you to go out in 100 degree heat and dig a hole. Let me tell you why. Because the Word of God, when you put the work into studying the Word of God, you might be looking for the answer to question A. And in your search, you might find the answer to question B. Or you might be looking for the resolution to solution X. And in so in looking for it, you find the resolution to solution Y. You see, because the Word of God is so overwhelming. The Word of God intermingles in so many different ways that the more you get it into your system, the more you work at studying it, the more you work at getting into it and diving into it with a fine-tooth comb, the more you comprehend it. The more you comprehend it, the more you practice it, the more you begin to look at it and say, I get it. Like, like the author of Hebrews saying, this is hard to explain, not because they're deep, but because you don't understand, because you're dull of hearing. But you, when you practice it, you shake that dullness of your hearing. And now all of a sudden you say, ah, what was once hard to me, for hard for me to believe, I just don't know if I can go there. Now all of a sudden, because you've practiced it, you've applied it in your life, now you can say, man, God is good. And you believe it. It builds your system up. In Acts, the 17th chapter, if you've got your Bibles, go with me to Acts in the 17th chapter. As you're turning there, let me give you a little bit of background. Because I want to show you something here. And again, write this down, read about it. It's interesting. In Acts, the 17th chapter, Paul and Silas are in a place called Thessalonica. You and I know Thessalonica from the book of Thessalonians. And here they're preaching in the synagogues and teaching in the synagogues like they would normally do when they would travel. The synagogues are like the Jewish uh, churches of the time. And they were teaching about Jesus Christ. And some of the religious Jews that did not accept what they were teaching got really upset and angry about what they were saying many people understood and, and, and grabbed a hold of what they were preaching and, and, and gave their lives to Jesus. But there were some religious people that did not want to do that, did not turn their hearts over. And what these people did is they went out into the streets, into the marketplace, and they got people that were not even holy, not even didn't even care about that, but they started rioting. They started a mob. They got a mob together that was starting a riot all over the city. And what they did is they went to the houses of the people that were harboring Paul and Silas and the like ministers, and they would drag them. A man by the name of Jason, it talks about in Acts the 17th chapter, they went to Jason's house and they dragged him out of uh, his house and they tried to have Jason killed by going to the authorities saying, this man is starting a revolt by preaching about a king other than Caesar. So they tried to have these people killed. So it was during these riots that Paul and Silas moved on to a town or to a township called Berea. And in Berea in Acts, the 17th chapter, in the 11th verse, we read about them teaching the word of God to them. And look what it says in Acts, the 17th chapter, the 11th verse. It says this, it says, 
says, these, the people of Berea, were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. In that, they received the word of God with all readiness and they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. They didn't just hear what the preacher said and said, okay, cool, I'll believe it. Rock on, there's my beliefs. Somebody asks you, why are you believing for healing? Because the pastor says so. Why are you believing for God to step in your situation? Well, because the pastor told me I should. No, see, that's a recipe for dullness of hearing, for recipe for failure in your spiritual walk. Why are you believing for healing? Because the Bible says so. Why do you know that? Because you studied it. Why are you believing for God to intervene on your situation? Because the Bible says so. Why are you believing that the attacks of the enemy have no place in your life? Because the Bible says so. And why does the Bible say so? Because you studied it and searched the scriptures daily. You see, so they were more fair-minded. They were not dense in their thinking or dull in their hearing. You and I have got to practice, to practice, to practice the Word of God. Are you with me today? One more for this morning, and then we'll conclude with this. One more for this morning. We're talking about uh, um, uh, uh, sharpening our hearing. The last one for today, number three, is to go and do it. I love Nike's theme. I love Nike's theme. It says, just do it. I wish for point number three, I could just put a swoosh. But I think for copyright issues, I don't think I could do that. So I had to reword it a little bit. But go and do it. Apply it. Let me say it like this. I've talked to you about sports. I've talked to you about art. I've talked to you about business. I've talked to you about students. Let me talk to you about money. Let me give you a monetary or a money example. Why? Because money talks. So look, at, let's say it like this. When you hear the word of God or when you make a priority and you hear the word of God, faith comes by hearing, that's like receiving income or receiving money, okay? That's like getting a gift, getting something, okay? You're receiving it. Now, when you practice it, that's like taking what you have received, faith comes by hearing, and when you practice it, that's like depositing it into a high interest savings account. And you know that it's gonna be safe, it's gonna be protected, it's gonna grow as time progresses, and, and practicing is doing that, it's like depositing and into that bank account. And now applying it is like taking, going to the bank and withdrawing what you have deposited and now spending it on that thing that you had been saving for. Hallelujah. And now the circle is complete. You have received, you have deposited, and now you are applying. And so you and I, and if you and I want to understand the word of God to, the, to its fullness, to the depth that God has desired for us to go to, we have got to apply it, to go and do it, to, to act upon the word, word of God. Remember, we talked about faith without works is dead. We have got to back up our faith, our practice, by working it as well. Are you with me today? Look at what Jesus says. I'm going to give you some scriptures. If you're taking notes or if you've got a phone, write these down because I want you to read these. I want you to study these. I want you to apply these. I know not all of you will, but I hope and I pray that you will because these will impact and change your life. You've heard of the Great Commission out of the book of Matthew, but let me tell you something. There are actually five commissioning statements that Jesus says to his disciples out of the four Gospels and the book of Acts. Today I'm going to give you the references to these five commissioning statements, and I'm going to show you what Jesus says about applying or doing what you have heard. Okay, so listen to this. Matthew, the 28th chapter. Matthew 28, verse number 19. Matthew 28, 19. Jesus is speaking to his disciples before he goes to the Father. And he says to them, go and make disciples. First off, he says, go. That's an that's a, that's a action word. That means don't sit, right? That means go, do something. Go and make disciples, he says, and goes on teaching them to go and be teachers of the word of God. Matthew, that's Matthew 28, verse number 19, 19 through 20. Now let's look to the second. Mark, the 16th chapter. Mark, the 16th chapter, 15th verse. Mark 16, 15. Jesus says to his disciples, go and preach. So Matthew, the 28th chapter says, go and teach. Mark says, go and preach. Because there's a difference between preaching and teaching. Preaching is the hallelujah, let me wave my, my handkerchief and run around the church because I'm so pumped up. Teaching is like, wow, okay, I got it. Go and preach, go and teach. Signs, wonders, and miracles will follow, he says. Now look at Luke. Luke, in the 24th chapter, 48th verse. Luke 24, 48. Jesus tells his disciples, go and be witnesses to the repentance and the remission of sins. So here, Matthew tells us to go and teach. 
Mark tells us to go and preach. Luke tells us to go and be a witness through our lifestyle to the repentance and the changeover in life. Now look what John says. John, in the 20th chapter, 21st verse, John 20, 21, Jesus says, I send you as the Father has sent me. So now we've been called to preach, we've been called to teach, we've been called to be witnesses, and we have been called with a mission or sent with a mission like Jesus Christ who came with a mission from God. You and I have been given a mission from God. Now look at Acts. Acts in the first chapter, 8th verse, Acts first chapter, verse number 8. Jesus Christ is speaking of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And he says, now you will be a witness to the power of the Holy Spirit in your cities, in your region, and across the world. So Matthew again tells us that we're supposed to teach. Mark tells us we're supposed to preach. Luke tells us we're supposed to be witnesses in our example of our life. John tells us that we are supposed to be sent with a mission like Jesus was with a mission. And now Acts tells us that we are a witness to the power of the Holy Spirit to our cities, to our states, to our countries, and to the world. It is never God's intention for you to hear the word of God and sit on it and do nothing with it, but rather to hear the word of God, deposit it into your bank, and now once you have deposited it, withdraw it and apply it, preach it, teach it, be a witness to the word, to be a witness to the world all across the world. Are you with me today? Let me say this in conclusion, and we'll finish with this thought in James, the first chapter, the 22nd verse. James, the first chapter, the 22nd verse says this, but be doers... Of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word but not a doer, so they hear but they're not doing faith without works, he is like a man observing him, his, his natural face in a mirror. Verse number 24. For he observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Verse number 25 says, But, but he, but. But, change of subject, change of thought, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is, and is not a forgetful, dull of hearing person, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Amen. Remember, Hebrews 11:6 6 said, without faith, it is impossible to please God. I don't know about you, I want to please God. And I don't know about you, but I know that when I please God, like James, the first chapter tells us, that when God is pleased with me, guess what God does to me? God blesses me. So I don't want to just be somebody that hears the word of God and it goes one ear and out the other because that's a hearer and not a doer. But I want to be a hearer of the word where the word of God, I hear it and the word of God tells me that faith without works is dead. And I don't want to be a dead Christian. I want to be a live Christian. So I'm going to take what I heard. I'm going to make it a priority to hear the word of God. I'm going to practice what I've heard and study it in my life and deposit that in, inside of me and I'm going to apply it and do it in my life so that I can be blessed in what I do. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord today? God is good, amen? Hey, listen, thank you for hearing the word of God today and listening to what we said and to remain and to stay here. It's important what we're going to do right now. And I want to ask you to do one more thing. Just give me a moment more of your attention. For those of you that left early that may not have been listening today, I want to encourage you. I got speakers out in the walkways, in the bathrooms, in the foyer, wherever you're at. Stop what you're doing and listening because of your eternal life may be at stake in this place today. So let me, let me ask you this question. And I want you to stop what you're doing and listen to what we're saying here. It's very important. Let me ask you this question. You know, it would be a shame for you and I to come together, hear the word of God, to, to, to praise and worship in the, in the spirit of God, and to leave this place today without giving you the opportunity to examine, to look into your heart, to look into your life, and see where is your stance with God. So let me ask you this question. If you were to leave today and you were to die, heaven forbid, hypothetically speaking, of course, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? It's a relatively simple question, but nobody's going to know that answer except you and God, not the person next to you or beside you, in front of you, the person you came with. It's between you and God. You know, you might say, well, but you know, Pastor Luca, uh, I think I'm going to get to heaven. I think so. Let me say this. If you believe that you're going to get to heaven, you say that. Let me ask you this. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? And let's go over that answer today. You know, you might say, well, but Pastor Luke, you know, I think I'm going to get to heaven. I hope I'm going to get to heaven. I sure want to go to heaven. Hey, did you know that nowhere in the Word of God will you find that you can think, 
hope or want your way into heaven that you can wish and wish wish enough to get into heaven that God's going to look on you and say, well, I'm going to let them in because they wanted it bad enough. Hey, nowhere in the word of God will you find that you can think your way into heaven or hope your way into heaven. You might say, well, but Pastor Luke, you know, I, 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 I wasn't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, or as a Muslim, or any other type of world religion. So I always just thought that by classification or by default that I was going to make it into heaven. D doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, a Hindu, or a Muslim, or any other type of world religion that you're going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says that? You'll never find that in the Word of God because there's more to it than that by default or by classification. You can't get to heaven that way. Well, but Pastor Luke, you know, I, I was baptized or christened as a baby. My parents took me to church on Christmas and on Easter. I went to Sunday school, Sabbath school, or catechism classes. My parents told me all my life that we were Christians. I call myself today or given myself the title of a Christian. I profess to be a Christian. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says it because your parents brought you to church, because you were baptized or christened, because you went to Sunday school, Sabbath school, or any other type of classes, because you went to church on Christmas and on Easter, because your parents told you you were a Christian, or because you believe or you call yourself or give yourself the name of Christian, mean that you're going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says that in the Word of God? Hey, hey, you won't find it in the Word of God because there's more to it than that. Oh, but Pastor Luke, I was a volunteer in the church. I, I, I carried the Pastor's Bible. I served in the children's ministry. I, I was a leader of a small group at one point in my last church. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says it because you carried the Pastor's Bible, because you sang in the choir or served in the children's or youth ministry or you were an usher, that you're going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says that? Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you sit in church, here is somebody speaking about the Word of God that you're going to get into heaven? Where in the Word of God does it say that? You won't find it. The bottom line is you can't get to heaven that way. Well, but Pastor Luke, Pastor Luke, Pastor Luke, I'm a good person. I was always taught all my life that good people go to heaven. Where do we get that thought? Where in the Word of God does it say that good people go to heaven? You know what? Nowhere in the Bible where you find that good people go to heaven. You can live your whole life, never rob in 7-Eleven, not cheat on your taxes. And let me tell you something. You're not going to make it into heaven because of that. Why? The Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God, are like filthy rags. You see, nothing we could do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. It's just not that way. The truth of the matter is, it's this, is that it's God's heaven. The only way you and I can get to God's heaven is God's way. And Jesus Christ uh, is that way. And Jesus Christ says this about himself. He says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man goes to the Father except through him. So that no, nothing you and I can do on our own, in our own way. We can't do it some well-meaning church committee's way or some, some well-meaning author's way. We cannot get to heaven our own way. We can only get to heaven God's way. Let me show it to you in the Word of God. In the book of John, in the third chapter, a man by the name of Nicodemus is having a conversation with Jesus about eternal life. And the Bible tells us that Nicodemus is a Pharisee, a leader of the Jews. What that means to you and I is that Nicodemus was a very religious man. Nicodemus had, had, was able to teach in the synagogues, the churches of his time. Nicodemus had memorized more scripture than you and I could think imaginable. Nicodemus gave to the poor. He wore all the right clothes. He said all the right things. Was a very good person. And when Jesus and Nicodemus were speaking to the subject of eternal life and heaven, you would think that Jesus would say to Nicodemus, pat him on the back and say, man, Nicodemus, your reward in heaven is great. You just keep on going. But Jesus says to Nicodemus this interesting statement. He says this, you must be born again. What does born again mean? You heard that term, Hollywood, popular culture, society has made, uh, dragged that term through the, through the coals. You think of that as a radical, crazy, out of control Christianity, but I don't care what Hollywood or popular culture says of it. They have no concept of God. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, the word born again, the term born again has always meant the same thing. And it means this, that you have given God all of your heart. Hey, you have given God all of your life. Hey, listen, 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 listen. Look at me, look at me. God is not after your mental ascent towards him. God is not after your carnal knowledge of who he is. The Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who God is. The devil can quote scriptures, yet you won't find him in heaven. Why? Because there's more to it than that. And Jesus tells us, uh, in the book of Revelation, the words of Christ in red, it, it's, it's an all or nothing relationship with God. And let me prove it to you. Jesus' words in the book of Revelation, last book of the Bible, Jesus says, speaking to the churches, he says to them, says to a church, I know your deeds. And when I come back, when it comes time for you to meet him face to face, he says, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Shocking statement. Well, what does that mean, lukewarm? Lukewarm, you think of it like this. It's a warm soda on a hot day. Jesus Christ says, if he finds you in that position, not too hot, not too cold, but right there in the middle, uncomfortable, doesn't taste good, he will spit you out of his mouth, the kingdom of God. What he's saying is that lukewarm Christians will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. 
Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me define it to you in terms of your relationship with God. Lukewarm means this, that in your relationship, you're a little bit up and you're a little bit down. Yeah, you're a little bit in, you're a little bit out. Occasional church attendance, a token prayer every once and again. Maybe you got a cross or St. Christopher. Maybe one day, one time, you went and got a Jesus tattoo somewhere on you. But you know what? You're not really wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted against God. You're doing some of your thing. You're doing some of God's thing. You're riding the fence right down the middle. And Jesus Christ says lukewarm Christians are deceived in thinking they're going to make it into heaven. Now, let me tell you something. I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough to tell you like it is, to tell you up front so that you don't go your whole life thinking that you're going to make it into heaven. Let me tell you something. God loved you enough. He gave everything he could for you to get into heaven. The decision's yours. I'm going to give you the opportunity in just a moment to, to, to ensure your place with God in heaven forever and ever and ever and leaving hell uh, and eternity in hell behind. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. Smack my hand on the Bible just like that. And when I do, I want to ask you to be bold. In just a moment, I'm going to give you the opportunity. When I smack my hand on the Bible, I want you to pop your hand up. And what you're doing by putting your hand up is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I acknowledge that I want to give Jesus Christ all of my heart. Pastor Luke, I want to go to heaven. You're acknowledging that you want to give him all your heart. You want to make him Lord and Savior of your life. You say, Pastor Luke, I can't raise my hand. If I raise my hand, you know what? I'm going to be embarrassed. If I raise my hand, somebody's going to see me. They're going to know something about me. And if I do that, I, I just don't know if I can. Hey, listen, you know what? You may be embarrassed. I'm not going to embarrass you, but even if you were embarrassed, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment for an eternity in hell? You see, the decision's yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way in. He has already done everything he could in his power to make sure that you get your place into heaven by giving for you his son, Jesus Christ, to die a beaten, bloody mess on a cross so that you could give him your heart, so that you can give him your life. Hell was not designed for you. Don't buy into the lie that you're going to party there because you're not going to do that. Don't buy into that lie today. Who should raise their hand in just a moment? If you've never given them all your heart, if you've never given them all your life today, when I count to three, I smack my hand on my Bible. If that's you, pop your hand up. I'll acknowledge it. I'll see it. I'll put it right back down. Who should get their hands up? Maybe you've never made a public profession of your faith. Maybe you're not sure. You did this as a kid one time in the children's or in the youth group, but you're not sure if you really did it or not. Hey, listen, get your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. We'll put it right back down. Lastly, who should get their hand up today? Those who are living lukewarm. You've been doing your own thing instead of God's thing. Running from God instead of to God. You've been riding the fence. Jesus Christ said, let's, it's time to get hot. If that's you living lukewarm, let's make today. Get your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. Put it right back down. Let's make today the day you go hot for God and ensure your place in heaven and not have to worry whether you're going to make it or not. Hey, today is the day of your salvation. Don't miss out. Don't walk out of this place today without making sure where you're going to be for eternity. The decision's yours. I'm going to count to three. And when I do, if that's you, get your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. I'll put it right back down. The decision is yours. Today is the day of your salvation. So here we go. Ready? Here we go. Hands are getting ready to go up. If you're in the Love Rock Cafe, get ready. Get your hand up. If you're standing out there in the, in the foyer or you're out there in the hallways, stop what you're doing. And when you hear this, you get your hand up. And we'll go on from there. Here we go. Ready? All across the side of the Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Three. Let me see your hands in the house today. Where are you at? Let me see your hands in the house today. I see you. One. Where are you at? Oh, come on. Where are you at? Two. I got you right there. Where are you at in the house today? Let me see your hands. Three, four, five. I see you down there. Okay, five people. Six, seven. I see you. Seven wise people. Eight. I see you back there. Eight wise people. Oh, come on. Where are you at? I see you. Nine. Oh, wait. No, no. You're not raising your hand. Here, pointing. I'm going to get you in there too. Where are you at? Somebody got their hand up? Eight wise people, where are you at? Anybody in the family rooms is their hands? I see people point in all directions. Where, okay, nine, ten, eleven, I see you. Twelve, praise God, I see you guys. Praise God, twelve wise people in the family rooms. Anybody in the family rooms, you got your hands up? Where are you at? Twelve wise people, listen to me. Uh, two in the foyer, thirteen, fourteen, praise God. Listen to me. You say, man, Pastor, I feel like you're pushing me. I feel like you're, don't you know, listen to, come on. Don't you know that the devil is pushing you to shut up and keep quiet? And you ought, you ought to be appreciative enough to know that somebody loves you enough to push you to get out of your comfort zone and do this for God. 14 wise people. I know that there's at least 10 more in this place, but the decision's yours. I can't make you. Anybody else in this place today? Anybody else? 14, maybe 15 wise people. Anybody else today? Anybody else? I'm going to close this up right now. Well, praise God for 14 or 15 wise people. Hallelujah.
Here's what I'm going to do. For those of you that raise your hand, whether you're in the back or whether you're in the front, whether you're, you're old or whether you're young, whether you're sitting in the Love Rock Cafe or in the outer foyer, I'm going to ask you to do something. You said you were going to give Jesus Christ all your heart. You said you were going to give him all your life. Let us help you today. Let us pray. Let us change destinies with you. In a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to stand. When I do, please, hey, listen. Listen to me. While you're here, listen to me. Have some respect for the Spirit of God and do not walk out as people are coming forward. That discourages them from giving their heart and their life to Jesus Christ. So come on, have a little bit more respect. And as we stand together, if that's you, if you raise your hand, come on, grab your coat, your sweater, your Bible, your purse. If you, a friend, if you need a friend, get out of your chair. Come and meet me up here today. Let's change destinies together. Come on. Come on, if that's you, you come, come on. From the front, from the back, come on. If that's you, if you're serious about this, you come. Come on, come on. You can come. They're coming. They're still coming. Come on. If that's you, if you didn't raise your hand or you did raise your hand, come on. Stop playing games. Let's go. Let's get forward for God. Come on. If that's you, come on. Hey, guys, listen, today is a new day. Hey, 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 listen, 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 listen. You are not going to a funeral, okay? You're going to a birthday celebration. It's your birthday. Today is a day you're going to be a new person. Praise God. It's a good day. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here waving at you? This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a pretty cool guy. He's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. I prom Listen, if you could put up with this guy, this is about as weird as it gets. Nothing weird goes on over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life. He's going to put into your hands some literature, some, some information to help you get strong in the ways of the God. Uh, a book that our senior pastor, Pastor Jim, wrote called Welcome to Your Destiny. Very easy reading, okay? 20, 30 minutes. Very small book. Very small book, I promise. And thirdly, he's going to do something. He's going to invite you into a program. Now, when I say program, that's kind of like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. What are we doing here? Listen, it's more like this. He's going to introduce to you a friend, a spiritual, personal trainer, a, a, like a personal trainer at the gym that comes alongside of you, helps you lift those weights. Make sure you're effective in what you're doing. A spiritual, personal trainer, somebody that will meet with you before service. You can come before church early enough and go into Love Rock Cafe. Hey, they'll buy you a cup of coffee, sit down with you at a table, open the Word of God, and teach you some things for a couple of weeks about the Word of God so that you get strong in the things of God so you don't go back to the life that you came from. So if you guys would just go right over there with Pastor Joel. 